Hello everyone and welcome to this History Indoors talk where, where we provide free talks on so many different topics uh, ranging from um, well Roman history all the way through to the present day. If you have missed any of our talks in the past then please do not worry you can find them all on our YouTube channel on this channel here so please do subscribe if you like this video as well so you can keep up to date with what's going on we'd love to uh, keep you updated with that but do check our videos we've got talks on so many different topics well world, world one talks world two victorian georgian you name it uh so if you have missed anything please do go check us out and watch all content we've got film reviews we've got history in shorts we've got so many different things i mean the, the amount of videos we have now is is just ridiculous um hundreds of videos so there's not short of content if you love history you got you're in the right place let's just say that right now um briefly for those who don't know my name is, is michael i am founder of history indoors i am also a historian as well um as well so uh great to have have you all with, with you uh, with us today how is how this works we will have a talk for um about 30 40 minutes and then we'll have a q a afterwards so don't rush off anywhere after talk's finished, but have a time of Q&A where you can ask us questions and we will respond and have a good conversation. Me and Mark have a great conversation and about, about the questions that you, that, you, that you provide and it will hopefully have quite a fun time as well doing it. So please do ask questions. Ask questions, ask questions during the talk as well. Um, so please do ask questions during the talk um, and we can respond to them as uh, at the end as well of that. Well, I think that's really all I have to do and say. Um, so I'll just introduce you to our, our speaker, which is uh, Mark Jones. So we, a couple couple months ago, we, we, we put out a, a form uh, for, 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 for guest speakers. And Mark was one of those who who responded to, responded to our call, um, which we're so thankful for. And we're so looking forward to hearing his talk. He is currently studying his master's at the University of Birmingham. And he's obviously, as you can tell, interested in uh, the the First World War, but also the army system a bit, bit before that as well. So I'm looking forward to this talk. That's another thing that I don't know much about. Being a very early modernist, being a very kind of Georgian kind of time period as well. So I'm I'm kind of new to this as well. So I'm looking forward to learning uh, this this alongside you guys. Um, so that further ado, Mark, I will disappear for a while. I'll come back at the end. Um, Yes, I'll see you all on the, the other side. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, thank you so much, Michael. It's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. And thank you to everyone who's come along to this talk and have given up their Wednesday evening. Um, I hope this is the talk you're expecting. And what I'm going to be talking about today is the British Army and the regimental system in the period from 1868 to 1911. Now, I'm going to begin by giving a very brief history of the British Army and its infantry regiments to help set out the context of the late Victorian army reforms and why it was felt they were needed. I'll then talk through the reforms themselves, moving on to, uh, moving on to the regimental system and the impact it had on the army before finishing with an overview of the state of the regimental system at the time of the 1911 census. This will be accompanied by some of the data that I've collected and a few illustrative examples from different regiments, which I think help highlight the trends that have been identified. Naturally, we're talking about something like 70 plus individual battalions, so it's, it's going to be very difficult to cover all of those in one lecture. Um, however, if you do have an interest in a particular unit or if you would like to kind of find out more about a particular unit, I'll do my best to answer any of your questions in the Q&A. And there's also some contact details for me as well, should you, you know, if you want to email me directly. So for many soldiers serving in the British Army in the late Victorian and Edwardian eras, the regiment would form the centrepiece of their military lives. Indeed, the historian John Baines writes that if anyone wants to know what was the quintessence of the morale of the pre-1914 army, what was the rock of its foundation, then the answer is the regiment. And the regimental system that lay at the heart of the British Army's identity was developed as a result of a series of different army reforms that were completed between the years of 1868 and 1881. While these reforms did not invent the regimental system, they fundamentally reformed the structure of the British Army's infantry arm. A central tenet of this system was the concept of localization of regimental recruiting, which saw regiments assigned to specific geographical locations, allowing for recruits to serve together in their local regiments. 
However, another really fascinating aspect of this period is the wider change that takes place in the British Army. In 1868, it was armed and equipped in a way that wouldn't have looked unfamiliar to a soldier marching with Marlborough's army 150 years earlier. However, by 1911, the army looked very different. The familiar red coats and muskets had gone, replaced by magazine-fed rifles, machine guns and khaki field dress. And it is these technological, social and organisational changes which I think made this period so fascinating to study. Whilst I'm sure many of you will be really familiar with both the British Army and military terminology, I think it's just worth taking a quick moment to orientate ourselves. In this talk, there will be two terms that have come up really frequently, that of battalion and regiment. Quite often, these terms are used interchangeably, particularly in the literature from the period. However, they do mean quite distinct things. A regiment, to quote the concise Oxford Dictionary, is defined as a permanent union of, of the army, typically divided into several smaller units. However, this definition varied quite significantly between different armed forces. And certainly during this period on continental Europe, the regiment would have been seen as a tactical unit that was used on the battlefield. In Britain, as we shall see, a regiment is principally an administrative unit. By contrast, a battalion, which is in itself a subunit of a regiment, usually numbered about a thousand men in the British Army. It fluctuated slightly throughout the period, but it was the principal tactical unit of the British Army and different battalions would usually be brigaded together to kind of serve on operations. This talk will also primarily focus on the regular army, that is the full-time professional army. However, the reforms of this period also affected both the militia and the various volunteer forces within Britain at this time. Now, the militia of this period were semi-professional soldiers who would be called up for periods of training each year, but were otherwise released to their civilian jobs for the rest of the time. Volunteers, by contrast, were civilians who would undertake military training infrequently throughout the year, usually a sort of few weekends and a few, re and a few um, weekly training sessions. As we shall see, the militia and volunteer forces had their own units, and their future coordination with the regular army was a major theme of the late Victorian army reforms. Finally, we shall see that infantry units went by a variety of different titles and designations. Regimental titles in uniforms reflected the history of each regiment and their various permutations were points of both pride and tradition. However, it is worth highlighting that irrespective of a regiment's title, whether they're rifles, fusiliers, light infantry, highlanders, by the turn of the 20th century, they are all armed and equipped in much the same manner, as we can see in this photo through 1909 of the Royal Irish Regiment. Now, as I said at the beginning of this talk, these reforms did not invent the regimental system. And the system of forming soldiers into distinct regiments extends right back to the very foundations of the British Army. However, up until the 18th century, regiments would return, routinely be referred to by their colonel's name, and this would change as each new colonel took command. So, for example, you might be Smith's regiment one week and then Jones's regiment the following. As you can appreciate, this was a challenge to administer and could also lead to du duplication. And there was a famous example of this in 1744 when there were two Howard's regiments, one commanded by a Charles Howard, the other one by a Thomas Howard. Ultimately, the army decided to distinguish between these two different regiments by giving them nicknames based on the colour of the facings of the uniform. So that's the, the colour bit that goes on the front of the red coat, with one regiment being known as the Green Howards and the other one as Howard's Buffs. And interestingly enough, both of these titles would be kind of retained throughout the regiment's history. Now, this issue was finally alleviated in 1751 when all infantry regiments of the line received a numerical designation based upon their relative seniority. For example, the first regiment of foot was raised, raised in 1633, while the 29th regiment of foot was raised in 1694. This was followed in 1782 by the assigning of county affiliations to regiments. However, these affiliations often were fairly nominal in nature and could often swap over time as well. Regiments also had no permanent base within their affiliated county. And as a result, it wasn't unusual for a significant number of soldiers to be recruited outside of the regiment's affiliated county. Now, as the long 18th century developed, it proved to be a really seminal period in the British Army's history. While the army grew significantly, this growth was not exponential. The army would expand as the nation went to war and then contract once again when, when the conflict ended. Some regiments would be called upon to raise multiple battalions, and at the end of the conflict, battalions and sometimes entire regiments would be disbanded, often as a cost-saving measure. 
And this was particularly true during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, with the army growing from around the region of about 40,000 soldiers in 1793 to a peak of almost a quarter of a million by 1813. However, when the war with France entered in 1815, the army once again shrank rapidly and only numbered 101,000 soldiers in 1821. Now, the number of infantry regiments also fluctuated quite significantly. So in 1815, there were 104 individual regiments, many consisting of multiple battalions. However, this number had been reduced to 99 single battalion regiments by 1824. But things had changed rather significantly during this period. Britain's burgeoning overseas empire had changed significantly, and both through the conquest of the territories of indigenous peoples, but also through the annexation of, of, their, of Britain's European rivals' own colonial possessions. Britain's North American, Australasian and, and Caribbean colonies were now joined by territories in the Cape of Good Hope, Southeast Asia and India. And this pattern of conquest would continue throughout the following 30 years, particularly in South Africa and in, on the Indian subcontinent. And by the middle of the century, Britain controlled a sizable overseas empire. However, the army itself remained a broadly the same size throughout this period, a model that would prove ultimately to be completely unsustainable. And matters came to a head in the 1850s, when Britain was beset by two separate crises. The first of these was the Crimean War. And the experience of the Crimean War was a really shattering one for the army. Although there had been plenty of heroism and the army had often fought bravely, the conflict had highlighted many of the institutional weaknesses of the British army, particularly in terms of its leadership, its training and also its organisation. Images of soldiers clo clothed in rags in the freezing trenches before Sevastopol, or of the sick and wounded dying in their droves at, at Scutari, were seared into the psyche of the Victorian army and that of the wider pro public. The problem was that almost immediately as this conflict ended, another one started. The following year, rebellion broke out in India. The First War of Indian Independence, best known in the Anglosphere as the Indian or Sepoy Mutiny, would stretch the army to breaking point. In response to the crisis, the 25 most senior infantry regiments, that's regiments 1 through 25, were all ordered to raise 2nd battalions, therefore doubling the number of battalions in those regiments, whilst a new infantry regiment, the 100th Prince of Wales' own Royal Canadians, was also raised for service in India, although the conflict had in fact ended before the regiment was ready for deployment. However, even with this expansion, the army was forced to draw battalions from across the British Empire and from Britain itself, leaving Britain Island perilously exposed without any adequate reserve in place. In summary, then, these crisis years had not only highlighted the army's inability to expand effectively in wartime, but it also made clear the army's inability to maintain a reserve of troops capable of defending Britain and Ireland, and also having an expeditionary force that could serve overseas. Now, in contrast to popular perceptions of the armed forces in the Victorian era, the British army was no stranger to reform. A series of royal commissions had been undertaken between 1857 and 1870 to investigate and recommend improvements to the army's organisation and administration. In the aftermath of the Indian mutiny, the East India Company, which had previously been responsible for um, the defence of India, and its army were both disbanded, with its European regiments, that is regiments that were re composed of British soldiers and led by British officers, being incorporated into the British army as regiments 101 through to 106. However, despite the efforts of civilian and military reformists, little was achieved in really kind of improving the army in terms of legislation. And it continued and reformists continue to face the significant resistance with both, within both military and political circles. Frankly, something needed to change. And that change came about when the Liberal Party came to power under William Ewart Gladstone in 1868. Now, Gladstone and his reformist government were keen to improve on both the efficiency of the army, but also its expense. The army was surprisingly expensive to maintain, given that its relatively small size and at various points throughout the 19th century actually exceeded the Navy's budgets, given the relative disproportionate cost of navies and armies generally as we look across history. But there were also really significant concerns about the army's capabilities. So it's not just an exercise in efficiency, it's also about making the army more effective in combat. Now, Cardwell's instrument for reform would be his newly appointed Secretary of State for War, Edward Cardwell. Now, Cardwell had had a really successful career in the colonial office, and he then subsequently served as an MP and held several important ministerial posts, including Chief Secretary for Ireland and Secretary of State for the Colonies. Now, 
Cardwell spent much of the first two years of his tenure assessing the challenges before him. And he ultimately seized upon a number of reformist schemes. Now, it's not possible to cover the full extent of the Cardwellian reforms in the time we have today. And some aspects, such as the abolition of the purchase of commissions and his work to restructure the war office, will have to be largely glossed over. Instead, what we'll focus on today are the aspects of his reform that directly impacted the regimental system itself. Now, Cardwell recognised there were two key problems for the British Army. The first was how we would maintain garrisons in Britain's overseas colonies while maintaining an adequate reserve of troops at home. With much of the army stationed abroad, keeping regiments up to strength was immensely challenging, and prior to 1868, units serving overseas had a greater authorised troop strength than those at home to offset losses from accidents, battlefield casualties, and most importantly, disease. However, the policy left battalions garrisons in Britain and Ireland chronically undermanned as they were stripped of soldiers to bring overseas units up to strength. And this had a really significant impact not only on training, but also on the ability then of Britain to defend itself if it came under attack from a European rival. And the threat of war in Europe remained a real, very real possibility. Although British politics towards Europe in this area can be characterised as a continuous attempt to maintain the status quo, the risk of conflict with France in particular remained a distinct possibility. And in fact, the army still had plans on what to do in the case of the French invasion as late as the, as the early 1900s. In addition, the formation of, an, of the Imperial German state in 1871 also raised the spectre of a new and powerful rival in Central Europe. The conflicts of the 1860s and 70s had also revealed a shift not only in the use of technology and firepower, for example, the adoption of rifles, steel forged artillery and railways, but also the organisations of armies themselves. European observers, including the British, had noted the challenges that had afflicted armies in the American Civil War due to their reliance on volunteer units being used to supplement a small corps of professional soldiers. Likewise, the wars of German unification had demonstrated the effectiveness of not only of localised recruitment, but also the impact of conscript armies on the battlefield. By contrast, Britain's own army appeared both old fashioned and ill equipped to meet these modern challenges. Another issue which R. Cardwell had highlighted was the relative quality of recruits. Royal commissions undertaken in the 1860s had demonstrated that the majority of recruits for the regular army were drawn from the very lowest strata of society. And this wasn't held by the nature of life in the army itself. Soldiers could expect poor conditions, harsh discipline and long terms of service, meaning that very often only the most desperate would seek to enlist in the army. And for many, it was very much the only alternative to starvation. This resulted in an army that was not only poorly educated, but often also physically unsuitable for military service. Oh, sorry, jumped ahead a little bit there. So how did Cardwell seek to address these issues? Well, one of the things he did right away was to withdraw British troops from all self-governing colonies, so places like Australia, the Caribbean, Canada, and the, where the army was replaced with locally raised militia and volunteer units. This policy was incredibly successful, and it actually saw 26,000 soldiers redeployed between the years of 1869 to 1871, a significant boom to the army's numbers. Cardwell also sought to improve the conditions for soldiers. In 1868, he abolished flogging and other harsh disciplinary methods in peacetime, although it should be noted that some punishments, such as branding, weren't officially removed from the army statute books until 1871. Now, this was pushed through despite really fierce opposition within the army, and flogging itself was retained as a punishment on, our, and on active service until it was finally abolished in the 1880s. Cardwell also ended the use of bounty money to, as, a, as a method to entice new recruits into the army. And he also simplified the process to allow known bad characters to be discharged from the army as well. But Cardwell intended to go much further, noting in the March 1870 army estimates that his intention was to develop a force which shall be moderate in amount and susceptible of easy expansion the reserve of which shall be so within reach as to be immediately available on the occurrence of any public emergency. In short, he wanted to ensure there were enough troops to be able to serve overseas and also serve at home as well. And the first step in this plan was the passing of the Army Enlistment Act of 1870, which is arguably Cardwell's most far-reaching reform. Prior to this, the length of army service was extensive, with soldiers potentially having to serve for 21 years under the colours. Unsurprisingly, these factors did not encourage recruitment. The new act itself kept the minimum initial service of length to 12 years, but also allowed soldiers to enter into the reserves after a period of time, 
So for infantry, for example, could serve a minimum of seven years under the colours before entering the reserves. What this enabled was finally allowing the army to have a cohort of trained reservists who would be in Britain and could be recalled to service in an emergency. Carbon next looked at the organisation of the army itself. As we've already seen, the pre-Cardwell army was a complex amalgam of regulars, militia and volunteers. However, these forces operated largely independent from each other. In addition, many recruits were enlisted into general service, which meant that upon joining the regular army, they could be posted to any regiments, a factor that did little to improve morale and build esprit de corps. Now, Cardwell sought to address this through the concept of localisation. And the Localisation Act of July 1872, followed very shortly by General Order 32 to the army, divided Britain and Ireland into 66 brigade districts, each of these districts being separated in accordance with existing county boundaries and also population density. Each district would be assigned two regular army battalions alongside local militia and volunteer units. Each district would contain a depot, which would act as a headquarters for the brigade's units and act as a focal point for recruitment for all of them. To enable this process to take place, single battalion regiments were linked together in pairs, with one serving overseas and the other being stationed in the district for the purpose of training and recruitment. So let's have a quick look at an example of this. So district number 19 covered the area of South Staffordshire, which is the kind of the region I grew up in. They, a, de a depot was set at Whittington Barracks in Litchfield and two regular army regiments were assigned to the brigade districts. In this case, the 38th First Staffordshire Regiment and the 80th Staffordshire Volunteers. In addition, two local militia regiments were also, sorry, militia battalions were, were also incorporated into the brigade structure. In this case, the 1st and 2nd Battalion of the King's Own Staffordshire Militia. And finally, it also incorporated local volunteer units, in this case, the 1st, 3rd and 4th Staffordshire Rifle Volunteers. Now, Cardwell intended for localisation to have two effects, to enable soldiers to be transferred easily between the two linked, linked regular battalions, and for these soldiers to serve alongside their comrades in order to maintain a sense of an esprit de corps. In addition, Cardwell hoped that the Localisation Act would improve and popularise the army, attracting recruits from the working classes who could often be enticed to service with the volunteers, but often proved far more reticent to committing to service with the regular army. In many cases, the Link Battalion shared a county affiliation, as we've seen from the example on screen. However, in some cases, the pairings were less obvious, such as that of the 47th Lancashire Regiment, which was paired with the 81st Loyal Lincoln Volunteers. In addition, some regiments stood to lose their existing county affiliations entirely, the two battalions of the 20th East Devonshire Regiment, for example, having to settle into a new depot in Bury and Lancashire. There were also a number of exceptions, as is often the case with the British Army. Firstly, these reforms only affected line infantry regiments. Those of the Guards, the Monarch's own household troops, and of the two rifle regiments were not affected. Likewise, while the cavalry, Royal Artillery and Royal Engineers all adopted localisation to a certain extent, this was not to the same scale as the infantry. Large regional districts were established, but recruits, particularly in the Royal Engineers and the Royal Artillery, were often transferred between individual bat batteries and companies of will. By the beginning of the 20th century, localised recruitment in these arms had largely been superseded. And as the historian David French has noted, what the ultimate army ultimately found itself with was, at, was multiple regimental systems rather than one single regimental system as Cardwell had hopes. It also should be noted that these reforms were not passed without difficulty. Although Cardwell enjoyed a surprising level of support across both sides of the, of the House of Commons, and had also acted shrewdly supporting existing reforming, uh, reformist ideas such as localisation and short service, he faced significant opposition within the army's senior leadership. Chief amongst these was the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, Prince George, Duke of Cambridge, ably assisted by his first cousin, who just happened to be Queen Victoria. However, despite this opposition, Cardwell ultimately triumphed. Through his reforms, he had, in the words of Edward Spears, constructed a military system that was administratively convenient, reasonably inexpensive, and capable of further refinements. Although his restructuring of the army was criticised, it still enabled the army to fight both its colonial conflicts and begin the process of forming a genuine reserve capability. Whilst it could not be said to have solved all of the army's problems, it represented a distinct improvement on the model that preceded it. 
Now, there was an enforced pause to these reforms because Gladstone's government was actually voted out of office in 1874. And as a result, Cardwell's reforms would not be finalised until the Liberals returned to power in 1880. Cardwell himself would not be there to finish the job. He'd been exhausted by his years of se as Secretary of State for War and had happily retired to the bank backbenches with a peerage. The new Secretary of State for War, Hugh Childers, took Cardwell's localization team scheme to its logical conclusion, transforming the brigade districts into new regimental districts and the linked regular army battalions into regiments. When the last amalgamations had been agreed, each regiment received a new territorial designation, which came into effect on the 1st of July, 1881. And this is very much, I would suggest, the kind of the foundations of the creation of the modern British Army regiments. And as we can see, going back to district number 19, it's been retitled to the regimental district of the South Staffordshire Regiment. And as we can see, all of the individual battalions, whether they're militia, regular or volunteer, have all incorporated that South Staffordshire title into, um, into their regimental name. Now, the process of formalising these arrangements was a long and complex internal process, with many regiments continuing to argue over matters of a tradition and uniform up until the First World War, and indeed often beyond. Um, I mean, this could be a subject of a talk in itself, because there are some fabulous examples of uh, kind of various regimental histrionics during this period. Um, for example, the 75th Stirlingshire Regiment was commissioned a marble monument to themselves when they were informed that they were to be amalgamated with the 92nd Gordon Highlanders. Not to be outdone, the 92nd staged the mock funeral procession for the regiment, complete with a full-size coffin with the number 92 inscribed upon it. And indeed, these regimental numbers continued to be a source of real importance to regiments, um, and individual battalions would often continue to refer to themselves by their old regimental number. And for historians of the Second World War, you'll notice that the Chindic col columns that were sent into Burma during the second during the during that campaign, the red the, the titles of the individual columns are actually the old regimental numbers for those regiments that took part. So as for the districts themselves, the majority of English regiments recruited from a single county, although some areas, for example, Lancashire, Staffordshire and um, Yorkshire, were cap thought to be capable of sustaining multiple regiments. And a small number of, regiment of English regiments were also responsible for recruiting from, uh, from multiple counties. And a good example of this is the Sherwood Foresters who recruited from both Derby and Nottinghamshire. However, in Ireland, Scotland and Wales, regimental districts often took on a more regional identity, with the majority of regiments recruiting across a number of counties. For example, the Royal Irish Regiment recruited from counties Kilkenny, Tipperary, Waterford and Wexford in the southeast of Ireland. However, as we can see from comparing these two maps on the screen together, there are distinct differences in population density across the UK, with some regimental districts having far smaller populations to recruit from. These factors, unsurprisingly, will have an impact on regimental recruitment and is something that we'll return to later in this talk. There also continue to be some changes to the, reg to the kind of regimental titles as well. Um, they were usually these changes were to accommodate the appointment of a new royal colonel. So an example for the uh, Princess Charlotte of Wales Berkshire Regiment gains the title royal in the 1880s. A more extreme example is that of the Oxfordshire Light Infantry, who realised in 1908 that they'd actually been recruiting from the county of Buckinghamshire for the last 30 years, and belatedly decided that they should really incorporate that county into their regimental title, resulting in the now more familiar Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry. There were also occasional adjustments to regimental boundaries as well. Most of these were fairly minor in nature. For example, in 1908, the King Shropshire Light Infantry gained the Welsh border company of Radnorshire from the neighbouring South Wales borderers. More rarely, extensive boundary changes were required. A good example of this is the King's own borderers, who were initially assigned a regimental district centred in York, but by 1887 had become the county regiment for four southeastern Scottish border counties with Berwickshire being transferred from the regimental district of the Royal Scots to the north, and Dumfrieshire, Roxburghshire and Selkirkshire being transferred from the Royal Scots Fusiliers. The regiment was then subsequently retitled to the now more familiar King's Own Scottish Borderers. Now, there were plenty of opportunities to put the new regimental system into practice. Between 1868 and, and 1901, the British Army engaged in 42 separate conflicts across the globe. However, it was a conflict right at the end of the Victorian era, the Anglo-Boer War, that was to have a drastic impact on the future of the army. Once again, the army had found itself humbled in combat and the British tactics, technology, logistics and leadership had all been found wanting on the plains of South Africa. 
Also, the regimental system had simply proven unequal to the task, with many regiments having rapidly exhausted their regimental reserves, leading to the return of cross-posting between different regiments. Furthermore, the incorporation of volunteers into the rank of the ranks of the British Army had seen mixed success, with many volunteer units suffering for lack of training or effective incorporation into the regular army formations. In addition, a number of regiments have been ordered to raise two additional regular battalions for service, although by 1911 all but three of these regiments had disbanded their additional battalions. Now, very similar to the Crimean War, a series of Royal Commissions were organised to assess the lessons that could be learned from the Boer War. Although from the perspective of the regimental system, one reform stands out in particular. In 1907, Richard Haldane, the Secretary of State for War, drafted the Territorial and Reserve Forces Act of 1907. And what this did was to reorganise the volunteer forces into a single territorial force, itself the forerunner of the Territorial Army and the modern Army Reserve. The same wave of reforms also saw militia regiments retitled as reserve battalions, formalising still further their role as an administrative hub for reservists. In summary then, after 1908, an infantry regiment comprised of at least two regular battalions, which would alternate between home and overseas service. In addition to the regular battalions of full-time professional soldiers, a regiment would usually have responsible for its reserve and extra reserve battalions. In England, Wales and Scotland, the majority of regiments will also have responsibility for their territorial force battalions. This wasn't the case in Ireland because the Territorial Forces Act was not enforced in Ireland and, it, and there weren't any territorial force units in Ireland. But to come back to the kind of, it feels like we've, it's taken a long time for us to get here, but to get back to the kind of the core question behind this presentation, how many men ultimately served with their local regiments? Now, one historical source which is available for analysis is the 1911 England and Wales census. The census was conducted on the 2nd of April 1911 and was the first in which British units and army units overseas were enumerated. And it represents a genuine moment in time which allows researchers to understand the origins of the men who were serving in the British army less than three years before the outbreak of the First World War. It also provides a direct insight into the makeup of the rank and file of the Edwardian army and can offer some conclusions as to the effectiveness of, locate, of local. This document itself, and you've got an example on screen in front of you, had a range of demographic data, including a soldier's name, age, rank, marital status, unit, occupation, and indeed place of birth. Men of all ranks completed the census, as did the wives and children of soldiers living in barracks at the time the census was completed. Now, the census isn't a regimental enlistment book, therefore a soldier's place of birth and not their place of enlistment. Occasionally, even this information is missing and a soldier's place of birth will simply be recorded as unknown. We should also recognise that populations are mobile, even in the Edwardian era, and it's not implausible to imagine that a soldier may have been born in one location, but have grown up and identified themselves with another place entirely. Furthermore, whilst recruits were enlisted within a specific regimental district, this is not to say that all recruits enlisted from that district were native to that area. I think these fact points are just worth bearing in mind when we look at the kind of data over the, ne over the next few slides. So what does the census tell us? Well, the first thing it tells us is when we actually look at the proportion of soldiers who were born within regimental districts of the various English, Scottish, Welsh and Irish battalions, the overall proportion proportion of soldiers who were locally recruited is actually sent on all of the different in Ireland is slightly lower 38 percent in Wales it's significantly lower 21 percent and intriguingly there's a real difference between Scottish regiments particularly those that recruited in the Highlands compared to those who recruited in the Lowlands And the picture can change quite significantly depending on the region, and this is particularly true in England. And when you look at the kind of the regional picture within England, it's noticeable that kind of localization has a really disproportionate impact. It works particularly well in East Anglia, where on average 63% of soldiers will be recruited within the regimental districts. However, as you move north, that number reduces really significantly, particularly in the northwest of England. Finally, although this doesn't relate directly to, um, to regimental districts and local recruitment, it's also interesting to look at actually nationality as well. So the proportion of soldiers who were born in the battalion's country of origin. 
And what we can see is that within English battalions, 94% of the repeat kind of the previous slides that we were looking at, what was really noticeable was that uh, there were real variations across the across both Britain and Ireland in terms of the proportion of locally recruited soldiers. And this was also true in terms of national recruitments as well. And what we can see from the chart on the screen is that something like about 94% of, of recruits within the average English battalion would be English born, with similarly high figures in the Scottish Highlands and in Ireland as well, but much lower numbers in, in Wales and in the Scottish Lowlands. And so having looked at that, what, um, what I'll come on to now is actually what this looks like in terms of individual um, some, some individual case studies, if you like. And the first one we're going to look at is um, Princess Louise's Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. So this is a regiment that recruited from kind of a, a, a thin strip of Scotland running from the sort of the, from the west coast through to the central belt, it also incorporating parts of what we would now see as kind of Greater Glasgow. And at the time of the 1911 census, um, the, reg the battalion itself was stationed at Tim Tarfa Barracks in Malta. Now, what's really noticeable is that 82% of the battalion were born in Scotland, so it's a distinctly Scottish battalion. However, the proportion who were actually born within the regimental district was much smaller. Um, and when you look at the kind of the top three counties where recruits were coming from, Renfrewshire is the only one that sits within the regimental districts. Lanarkshire, which incorporates at this time incorporated a good chunk of Glasgow as well, raised something like 254 soldiers, while Midlothian, which also included the city of Edinburgh, had a further 90. And this is very reflective of what you see across the Highland regiments. Those which were fortunate to have a urban centre within their regimental district, so something like the Black Watch, for example, that had Dundee, often were able to recruit a higher number of local recruits compared to those in more rural locations. So, for example, the Seaforth Highlanders who are in the northwest of Scotland, actually they're having to draw a significant number of recruits from places like Glasgow and Edinburgh, which are well outside of its regimental districts. Comparing that to the lowland to a lowland regiment, we can have a look at the first battalion of the Royal Scots Flute Fusiliers. So this is a battalion that's recruiting from the kind of the southwest of Scotland across the, the sort of Scotland England border, and at the time of the 1911 census, is stationed in Pretoria. And what's immediately noticeable is a that the number of Scottish-born recruits has reduced dramatically if you compare them to the Argyles, but also that there are significantly higher proportion of English-born soldiers within. The, within the battalion. And on top of that, the actual proportion of those who were born within the reg regimental district was really quite low. And this is fairly typical across all lowland regiments, although I would say there is some quite significant variation as well. If we cross the Ir Irish Sea, we'll have a look at sort of a typical Irish battalion. And in this case, there's a great example of, in, the, in terms of the first battalion of the Connaught Rangers. Now, Irish recruitment tended to take on more of a provincial tone, and, and the Connaughts were a really good example of this, with them recruiting from four counties that made up the uh, province of Connacht. And at the time of the 1911 census, they, they are based in Jalandha, in, in the Punjab, in northern India. Now, I'll come to the map in a second because the map itself is a, little, is a little unusual, so bear with me. What we can see again is that there's actually a high proportion of soldiers who are who were Irish born of something like eight out of every 10 within the battalion. But again, there is actually a significant sort of minority of, of English soldiers as well. And, and this is something you see particularly in sort of Scottish and Irish regiments and even more so in Welsh battalions, where sort of usually the kind of the second highest national group within a battalion will usually be English. But what we can see is actually the proportion of soldiers who were born within the regimental district is actually quite low. It's just over a quarter of the of the total in the battalion. And what you can see from this map, and it's a, it's effectively a heat map. So the counties which are highlighted in darker colours are have a higher proportion of recruits. If you're wondering where Northern Ireland's gone, it's just simply that there were there weren't any recruits count from those particular counties. But you can see, for example, in the wider province of Ulster, that there were recruits coming from places like Donegal and Monaghan. But what's really noticeable is if you look on the right hand side of the map, there's a really darkly, it's a kind of really densely coloured um, county, and that is the county of Dublin. And very much like the Highland regiments, if an Irish regiment had a kind of a major urban centre at its heart, it was able to usually recruit a far higher proportion of soldiers within its local districts. Um, a good example of this being someone like the, the Royal Munster Fusiliers who had the city of Cork. Crossing back across the Irish Sea, um, it's a good opportunity for us to have a look at a Welsh battalion. 
And in this case, we'll look at the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, or more specifically, their 2nd Battalion. Now, this was the point when I realised that um, people weren't listening to me anymore, because I just started on a little a bit of a mini rant, so I do apologise. But es essentially, if anyone's wondering why they're called the Welsh Fusiliers and not the Welsh Fusiliers, that title was very traditional and had been used by the regiment previously. And again, it was used by the regiment officially from 1922 onwards. However, during this particular era, it, it, they were the Royal Welsh Fusiliers and that title had been anglicised. And as you can see, the regiment itself recruits from across North Wales. And at the time, the 1911 census was stationed in Quetta, which is, was in the state of Baluchistan, which is now in the modern country of Pakistan. And what's immediately noticeable is not only the high proportion of English recruits, well over two thirds of the battalion, but the fact that so many of them come from a particular region, in this case, the West Midlands. And this has actually entered into kind of the identity of the regiment itself and um, soldiers serving in other countries, sorry, in other battalions would often refer to them as the Birmingham Fusiliers, something which was it was pretty much guaranteed to cause a bit of a punch up in the pub on the Saturday. But again, what we can see is that a really low proportion of soldiers were actually born within the regimental districts. And this is something which is typical of Welsh regiments, but it's also typical of regiments that recruit in very rural communities like North Wales. And it's something that we'll return to a little bit later in this presentation. So far, I've presented quite a, a negative impersonation of, of the regimental system. And um, what I'd like to do is actually look at something where localization really has worked. And a great example of this is the 1st Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment. So this is slightly unusual for an English county regiment in the sense they recruited from two separate counties, Suffolk, but also neighboring Cambridgeshire. And at the time of the 1911 census, it was stationed in Egypt with most of the battalion in barracks in Alexandria, but actually a small contingent serving with the Camel Corps. Um, which is one of those sorts of forgotten units of empire, if you like. Um, and what's immediately noticeable is not only the high proportion of English-born soldiers, well over 98% of the battalion, but also its strong regional East Anglian identity as well. And this is something that we do see across various different English regiments, where there's even if the, reg the proportion born within the, re the regimental district is fairly small, the overall kind of it has a much stronger regional identity. In the case of the Suffolk Regiment, this isn't true because it also has a very kind of a very strong uh, local connection, as we can see. So a more typical example, perhaps, is the 2nd Battalion of the Cheshire Regiment, which sits very much on that median line of um, English battalions and the proportion of, of local recruits that they're able to get hold of. This is a very typical English county battalion recruiting from a single county and at the time in 1911 was stationed in Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh, which is in central India. And what's noticeable again is the kind of the high proportion of English recruits, but also that there is a still a very kind of a strong um, northwest of England identity to the battalion, even if the proportion of soul, even if less than half of the soldiers in the battalion were actually born in the county of Cheshire itself. And this is perhaps probably a, a fairer representation of the majority of English battalions in this period compared to something like the, uh, like the, like the Suffolk Regiment. But as I've said already, this is very much a kind of a single point in time. And it's interesting to kind of compare how 1911 looks compared to the kind of the wider period we've been covering. And one source of information for us to look into is David French's uh, fantastic book from 2004, Military Identities, The Regimental System, The British Army and the British People. And one of the things he looks into is the average percentage of soldiers who were born within regimental districts between 1877 to 1900. And to do that, he not only looks at census documents, but also looks at kind of a wider set of resources as well. And so it actually creates, although it's not an exact comparison, it does create kind of an interesting way of us being able to compare across both of these periods. And in order to do this, because there are over 75 battalions in this study that I've conducted, and we can't physically can't fit them all on one, on one chart or on one screen. And so what I've looked to do is to look at the top and bottom 10 battalions in terms of localised recruitment in 1911 and compare those figures back to the data in between 1877 to 1900. And there are a few things that come out of it which are really interesting. So if we look at the top 10 regiments, the first thing you'll notice is that actually for the majority of regiments, there isn't a significant amount of change. And in fact, overall, there's actually kind of quite a positive movement to an increase in local recruitment. In fact, the only regiment that actually sees a reduction is the Hampshire regiments, and even then that reduction is fairly limited. There are some examples where that change is more significant. I mean, the Devonshire regiments are a really good example of that, same with the Sherwood Foresters as well. 
But then compare that to the bottom 10 regiments and the differences are startling. And one of the things you'll see straight away is that there is a massive collapse in local recruitment in the north of England, particularly in Lancashire and Yorkshire. I think this would be something which would be really interesting to dive into in greater detail. And um, it's not something I've done personally. And my, my kind of best assumption really is that this is principally an economic decision so those soldiers where through those sorry those individuals from which the army usually recruits you know so people who don't have stable jobs and don't have um kind of stable income are able to find work and as a result they're not being kind of forced into considering the army as an alternative to starvation um, and as a result various different battalions are then having to reach out further afield to to gather more recruits and a great example of this is actually the sort of the prince of wales own south lancashire regiments which actually has a significant number of irish recruits in this rank which was something which is very common in the british army in the kind of sort of in the napoleonic era but something which really isn't something you see in the kind of the later 19th and 20th centuries the other kind of key finding as well is if you look at the regiments where there are, are much kind of smaller changes, what really ties all of these together is the fact that they all recruit from very sparse rural communities, very much like the Royal Welsh Fusiliers we mentioned already. Um, and I think this is one of the kind of the real Achilles heels of the regimental system in the sense that actually there were some parts of the UK which were always going to be really difficult to recruit from and to maintain a high number of local recruits. And these regiments had always had to kind of reach further afield. So the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry is a really good example of this. They in fact had a regimental recruitment office in London to kind of offset that kind of lack of local recruits that they were able to get. So in conclusion, did localization work to or improve and popularize the army? And I think the short answer is not really. Localization, as we've seen, had a variable impact across Britain and Ireland and truthfully never really achieved its aim of improving and popularizing the army. Indeed, recruits of the Edwardian era differed little in, in background to those that preceded them. And the army continued to rely on low classes to form the backbone of its infantry battalions. In this sense, I would agree with the words of Professor David French when he suggests that really, if we try to kind of suggest the regimental system is, is the kind of the, the cure to all of the ails of the British Army, then that simply isn't the case. And it really kind of defies both logic, reality and the data that's available. Where I do think the lo localization really worked was in developing that sense of esprit de corps. And there's a great quote, um, which I'll finish this talk on, which actually comes from 1945, so a little bit later in this period, and it's a, a, a sort of an officer of the Second World War serving with the Essex regiments, um, who's kind of reflecting on the fact that there are very few Essex-born soldiers within his battalion anymore. And what he says is that, fortunately, we know now that you need not be Essex-bred to make a good Essex soldier. And I think this is something that would have been reflected in the thinking of much of the wider army as well. So that brings this talk to its end. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, just thank you so much for bearing with me. I apologize for the kind of the IT issues that we've had. As I said, I'm more than happy to answer any of these questions. I'm sure Michael might want to go and do other things as well, but if there's, I'm more than happy to answer any of the questions you have. And, and thank you for taking the time and sticking with this talk as well. All right, thank you, Mark, for, for that. I, absolutely, I was, you know, I, you know, I was really enthralled by everything you were saying, and then you, when you went, I was like, "No, oh, but I want to know more." <laughs> um, <and> that was, <laughs> um, but that was really fascinating, and I was saying, I was saying our audience as well that you know, because I study kind of the you know, local local density in the late Victorian period and the early Edwardian period, and and you know, I, I I can see some of the things you're saying as well in society as well, and how the army is also trying to connect locally um oh, yeah, exactly. especially in like colchester you've got the barracks trying to connect with the town so there's those kind of links there but also you said how it didn't work in places as well i thought that was fascinating see how it how you know, the complete contrast where they, it goes down so much um I, yeah so that, that's gonna be thinking about localization in, in other ways and how it may link into our places so thanks so much for that it's got me thinking oh, anyway oh, you're welcome it's an absolute pleasure <laughs> um do people have any questions this is time for you to ask away uh, some people, if you if you can't use a YouTube chat for any reason, you can always Twitter me if you've got any you've got any questions. Um, I know because apparently some people have issues with the YouTube chat for some reason. Uh, it, apparently it's a day for this, isn't it? It's a day for for technolog technological issues. But do you put any questions in, or do uh, just send me a message that way? Um, if not, I can start off with um, with some questions uh, for you, Mark. If that's okay. Um, 
So, you've spoken about the infantry regiments which had local equipment. Of course, we've talked about that. But have you looked at regiments which were recruited nationally, like the guards or the rifles? Uh, yes, I have. So, not admittedly, not all of them, but a good, but a good chunk of them. And it's it's really interesting because um, it, it varies quite significantly and surprisingly. So, if you look at the guards, for example, there's um, there is obviously a very clear attempt to try to try and really kind of to kind of really focus on the national on national recruitment. So, you can look at something like the Grenadier Guards, for example, and you can find recruits from across England very comfortably, and also a contingent from Wales as well, because this is pre. No, this is pre this is pre nineteen fifteen. The Welsh Guards don't exist, so Welshmen are kind of naturally being drawn into the Grenadier Guards. Compare that to someone like the Scots Guards, for example, and there's a really kind of some really interesting things actually, because there is obviously a very strong Scottish contingent, and particularly from Glasgow, it has to be said. And there is and there are kind of traditional connections between the Glasgow Police Force and the Scots Guards, which was also replicated in the other Guards regiments as well. But the regiments also, Scots Guards also had a really strong tradition of recruiting from the north of England as well, and particularly Yorkshire. So you see a lot of um, recruits, particularly from Leeds, who were serving within the Scots, he perceived serving within the Scots Guards. And that is a long standing relationship. It's not something which was particular to 1911. With the rifle regiments, it's interesting, uh, just for kind of clarity. There were at the time of 1911. There were officially there were four rifle regiments, but two of them were relatively newly created. So one was the um, Cameronia Scottish Rifles, which is a fascinating regiment in its own right. Um, in terms of kind of falling out over regimental traditions, they are the kind of the exemplars. Um, and there's also the Royal Irish Rifles as well. So these are two regiments that have been converted from, if you like, regular line infantry regiments and had kind of gained a, a, a sort of a rifle status. Um, the two traditional rifle regiments, so, you know, if you've been, if you've watched Shark or anything like that, you know who I'm talking about. Um, they're very different. I mean, firstly, they're far more socially exclusive, certainly in terms of their officer corps um, than either of the other two regiments I've mentioned. And again, they recruit very extensively from England and there is this kind of very national picture. But one of the things which was really interesting in 1911 is there does seem to be this split um in recruitment and although so both really heavily recruit in london and this is something which is true across the army if you mm. the kind of the second highest proportion of soldiers pretty much across all regiments will, will almost certainly come from london but then what uh, beyond the kind of london-born recruits what you tend to find is that the king's royal rifle corps tend to kind of focus their recruitment sort of from kind of the midlands northwards while the so while the Rifle Brigade tend to to kind of concentrate their recruitment in the south of uh, south and east of England by comparison, and the the difference isn't significant but it is noticeable. So there does seem to be almost like a, an unofficial regionalisation going on um, within the rifle okay. battalions. But yeah, but it look it is really interesting in itself. And although again not really part of localisation because it, it they, because they recruit in a very different way, but there are some really interesting kind of stories to be told within that. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking as well, just he's saying that as well as he's speaking, is because you mentioned in your talk, the, in, in, even in the Irish regiments, you had you had English soldiers in the Irish regiments. Like, yeah. do, how 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 did that happen? Was it because they were they were born in England and then they, or the fact that the Irish Irish recruiters went to England to recruit? Is that what is what is that what took place? They send recruiters yeah, out it, to just reach people. It, it's an interesting one because I think. It's difficult to say, unless you kind of start tracing individual soldier stories, it's quite difficult to, it's quite yeah. difficult to tell. As far as I'm aware, I don't, I, I'm not sure of any research which has really kind of directly looked into that. From the kind of the, kind of the secondary evidence, if you like, and the kind of the other sources which are out there, even with the development of regimental districts, it wasn't unusual for, for regiments to, to kind of recruit outside of their area. So we've talked already about people like the Royal Welsh Fusiliers and the Duke of, Duke of Cornwall's like in, Light Infantry, who very deliberately recruit in different parts of the country. And I think it's probably not unusual to imagine that would also be the case with other, with other regiments as well. Equally likely, you might, I mean, you can imagine the kind of situation where maybe someone's left England to go to Ireland, hasn't worked out that you know they have no job they have nowhere to live and what's the best you can't can't afford he can't afford the ferry trip back across the Irish Sea and so what's the alternative and then of course you have things like tradition as well so you know it, you might have a soldier who might have been born in Aldershot for example to Irish parents in an Irish regiment oh, who's yeah. gone back to then serve in their own regiment so there are lots of different kind of interesting that's like tangles yeah. to that, but yeah, I, th I think the honest answer is there's probably multiple routes in. I'd suspect. 
Uh, that's, that's, that's absolutely fascinating, though, because you know, I, I was me just thinking one one thing, but then actually, no, there's actually pretty like multiple things, reasons why that is the case. Um, which, yeah, which, which seems now obvious, really. But I'm going to ask yeah, questions. No, yeah. um, we've got some questions here. So uh, one question is. If you were in the reserves, as, as you mentioned, you know, the reserves uh, there, how would you be contacted if needed? How now, that, that's, a really, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I know Simon, so thank you for that question, Simon. It's a corker. Um, so this is really interesting. So the only so the, there's obviously the experience of the Boer War, but probably the better example is that what happens in 1914. And I think one of the things which sometimes, so when people think of the British Army in 1914, um, what they tend to think of is like all these kind of grizzled regulars going off to, to France and Belgium and you know, slaughtering waves of, of German conscripts because they're all battle hardened from their experiences in Africa and India. And while that was true for a kind of a proportion of those soldiers, actually a significant amount of the original British expeditionary force was brought from troops who were either reserves, and we'll come into that into a second, but also relatively young recruits. Because again, you have to remember the regiments, that are, sorry, the battalions which are in Britain are, are, you know, one of their main aims is they're training and they're recruiting. And quite often they're sending drafts overseas. So they're constantly under strength all the time. And that, this causes a real problem in terms of training. Um, and there was so, so when regiments are kind of sort of preparing for war in 1914, some of them are having to kind of sort of 60% of their strength is coming from reservists. Now, these reservists could have been out of the army for you know, a matter of weeks through to, you know, a decade. And as a result, you know, fitness and fitness is really variable. And there's, there's a lot of colloquial evidence, particularly in the 1914 campaign, of lots of kind of reservists dropping out on the march because they're being equipped with boots which don't fit them anymore. And like they're really struggling on like the big paved roads of France. But in answer to sort of Simon's question about how, how that actually happens, essentially you've got a telegram. So you'd have to let the army know where you lived. Um, mm. What would happen would be sort of the order would go out to an individual regiment. And in fact, actually, I, I would really recommend a person who's great, to, to, who's done, done this really well for the Suffolk Regiment, interestingly enough, um, has a, a guy called Taff has really kind of gone into details with this and people on Twitter will know Taff well. But what um, essentially what would happen is like the order would come from the war office to the individual battalion they would have a set a kind of a preset of instructions that they would follow and one of those would effectively be to kind of telegram every soldier who was a reservist which would instruct them to then go back to the regimental depot so if you use the example of the south staffordshire regiment for example that would expect all of the soldiers to come back to Lichfield. And from there, they would then be sent to the sent to battalions as they were needed, and then that that battalion would then go overseas with the British Expeditionary Force. Um, as you can imagine, that works. You know, if you're down the road, that's really quick. It's a matter of hours. Um, if you're coming from further afield, it can take you several days. And so, as a result, what you tended to find is once the battalions had gone over to France, they'd take the kind of the best of the bunch, if you like, with them, leaving behind sort of a cohort of either those who were too young or maybe those who were too old or too unfit, and then they would be joined by the various different reservists who would be coming from further afield and it was those troops who provided the main were the main source of reinforcements in 1914 and early 1915 so what the army kind of found which they hadn't anticipated was as they took higher casualties as they were having to rebuild individual battalions they were doing so with and i mean this in the in the most respectful way i can but less effective material very often mm -hmm. um, and so actually that kind of level of experience and knowledge was kind of redu constantly reducing over that time and then eventually the kind of the volunteer movement has really kicked off. You've had Kitchener's armies and all of that, and you start to get the new army recruits who are coming into the old regular battalions and then obviously forming their own divisions as well. So that's a very long answer to your question, Simon. So I do apologize, but um, oh, hopefully that's that fascinating as well. Yeah, that'd be fascinating though as well, as well. To see also say, I guess to see just because in the telegram one technology being used as well in all this restructuring mm. and you know and, and and as well, you know, without without the technology, it would have been difficult to do that. Um Another question from Alec, um, which is a big question, which is during the deployment period, there was a strong pull through from the militia to the regular army. Does the relative lack of local recruits in the, in, in the Edward, in Edwardian era suggest this was no longer the case? It's, it's a really good question, and it, it impinges a little bit in a period that I'm not as familiar with, so I'll, I'll give the best answer I can, I think, Alec, but it's a great question. I think essentially the militia has a bit of an identity crisis 
throughout the 19th century. So certainly during the Napoleonic War, exactly as Alec has said, there is this strong pull through of the militia. So if you remember when it was going through the regimental district, the 80th Staffordshire Volunteers, that a lot of the early recruits for that particular battalion had been drawn from the Staffordshire militia, for example, when it was raised in the 1790s. But I think it, there were two kind of problems I would suggest. I think one is, I think the militia had a bit of a bad rep, um, mostly because it, it's certainly in the kind of the first half of the century, they're very heavily involved in, in sort of putting down various different elements of insurrection. So you think of the Gordon riots or the Bristol riots. So there's a sort of an unpopularity there. But then on top of that, it's kind of a, then with the kind of with the volunteer movement really kicks off in the kind of the middle of the 19th century, because eventually, effectively everyone's worried that France is going to invade. And so they get this. So lots of people get lots of mostly middle class people, it has to be said initially, get this idea that what would be brilliant is if we'll equip everyone with rifles and then when the French involved, we'll we'll just fight them and it'll be great. And over time, that that kind of changes. I mean, the ter- I mean, the, the kind of development of the territorial force and the army um, and the volunteer movement in this period is really fascinating because it actually demographically looks very different. To the regular army um, and varies quite significantly as well depending on where you are in the country but as a result is really starting to fight in the same space of, as the militia and so over time what the militia battalions kind of convert into more is again this this kind of general but not very well defined reserve movement certainly in the pre cardwell era and it's also in for officers as well it's actually kind of a sort of an alternate route into the army as well so if you're unsuccessful getting into Sandhurst, either maybe you're too old or you didn't pass the entrance exam. It's much easier to get a commission in the militia and then potentially that potential to then transfer from the militia into the regulars as well. So eventually, by the time you get to the end of the period, it's taking on a much more specific role as a as a reserve as as a kind of as the administrative hub for reservists and that kind of traditional militia kind of role of the militia is very much transferred into the volunteers. Or that's what I'd suggest anyway. Brilliant. Thank you. I've, we've got one, one question from Twitter, which I'll, I'll ask, and then I'll ask one more question uh, from there as well, which, um, why did the British Army not move to a three battalion regiment system like everyone else? <laughs> Uh, if not, well, yeah. did they consider it? Um, I think it's a re- I think this is a really interesting question, actually, because um, I think there's a, probably a short and pithy answer is because it's just not British. I think is probably part of it. <laughs> a, a more sensible answer, if you like. Um, I think on the one hand, I, th- I think one of the things which is important to remember is that Britain, for most of its history, is very much on the periphery of Europe. Um, and so military trends and fashion tends to hit Britain quite late. And you can see this like within the cavalry in particular, where you kind of get kind of things like Dragoon Guards and Light Dragoons as regimental titles. You don't get that elsewhere in Europe. It's a very kind of uniquely British um, designation for cavalry. And things like Hussars, which have become really popular by the kind of the middle of the 18th century, it takes really until the Napoleonic era for that to kind of really become popular within the British Army. And you suddenly see all these Light Dragoon and Dragoon regiments being converted to Hussars. Um, but and so there is that element of that. And I think again, so as I mentioned at the top of the talk, for the British Army, I think the regiments, a regiment and battalion, for long periods were kind of synonymous with each other anyway. You know, there's quite long, lengthy periods of time when regiments are only consisting of one battalion. So effectively, they're almost one and the same thing. But then also on top of that, the kind of the way armies are structured are quite different as well. And so you you don't see in you don't really see peacetime brigades, for example, forming until quite late in the era so actually when regiments are then serving overseas they're usually kind of being drawn together quite ad hoc but on the continent and particularly once you start to get conscription coming in you have these much more structured systems where you will have you know companies which are feeding into battalions and three battalions will form a regiment and two regiments will form a brigade and two brigades will form a division and all the various permutations of that and these are very much tactical formations so these will be used so a regimental commander will command his battalions on the battlefields and again you'll see this in the second world war as well with britain it just never really takes off like that i think they also get very wedded to this idea that you'll have one regiment well, sorry one battalion which is at home recruiting and one battalion overseas which is serving. And that works really well when you have two. It makes it much more complex when you have three or or more or like sort of mm. odd numbers of that. I mean, there's there are some intru- I mean, one of the things I didn't mention in the talk just simply because of time is that even with all of the kind of regimental amalgamations and all that, there was actually an odd one out. There was still one, there was a, still a single battalion line regiment, which was the with the Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders. 
why that was the case, I think essentially they were one of Queen Victoria's favourite regiments and she didn't want them to kind of change. There was a kind of a movement in the 1790s to kind of turn them into the 3rd Battalion of the Scots Guards. That doesn't take off. And so eventually by about 17, I think it was 1898, they finally actually get around to forming a 2nd Battalion, which is like a good almost 20 years after the reforms have taken place. So there are various kind of contrary natures to stuff. And I think the, the army were just kind of happy to, to, it was tradition by that stage to kind of operate and work in that way. And certainly by the time of the kind of the, the post-war war era in particular, you do have these home service brigades, like which will be numbered brigades, like first, second, third, etc., where battalions will kind of swap in and out, but the actual brigades themselves remain quite static things okay. um, and, yeah. and that's kind of how the british army really develops for for the rest of its history yeah absolutely fascinating to, 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 to think about that and you know, the capacity between especially england and europe i mean uh, you know I'm, I'm fascinated by that naval kind of structures yeah, yeah. and you know from the early modern period on into the modern period and you see that kind of the different shapes and forms that navies take as well. Well, I won't go into that at the time <laughs> for naval discussion, uh, but yeah, that's also fascinating as well. You know, the, just the differences and the reasons why there's differences as well. I think that is really interesting. I'll ask one more question, and then um, and then we can all um, all, all, all uh, go our separate ways. But the question is, I think it would be really helpful for people as well. Um, is where can you find out more about? you know, uh, regimental red, red, systems as a whole. And maybe as well, onto on that, you know, how can you, f- how can you find military census documents as well? Maybe that's the, the two questions, but maybe they're quite good questions to ask for people, you know, uh, if they want to know more about this, these things, where, where can I find out information? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll do them in reverse order if that's, if that's okay. So okay. essentially in terms of census documents, First and foremost, you can go down to the National Archives. You can obviously view them for free. You do have to pay for your train fare to get there, so it is still quite an expensive undertaking, but you would be able to kind of trawl through the archive documents themselves and look at them. For for how I did it, and how I think most people are able to access census documents, is through genealogy websites. So we know the ones that we're talking about, so people like Ancestry and Find My Past. So in terms of my research, I tended to use Find My Past. That's just personal choice. It's mm-hmm. not because I think you know they both offer very similar functionality. Um, and you can do it that way. So most of them will have a tab for military records, and then you can obviously then sort of shrink that down to like particular, like you know, census documents and particular census um, years. And generally speaking, how I tended to do it would be just to kind of t- to almost type in the, the regiment I was looking for. Um, and if you set it to the England and Wales census overseas as well, and this was the key thing for my research, so these are all battalions which are serving overseas in 1911, not the home service battalions. Um, it's usually quite easy to find them because essentially all the reg- the regiments or the regiment will all sorry the battalion will usually all be together in a in a cantonment or barracks wherever they are in the world. So once you found one soldier and you found the right battalion, you can find everybody else. You've just got to scroll and find the beginning of that particular census record and then work your way across. Um, if you obviously know a particular soldier, then just search by name. That's really simple. Um, if you are interested in looking into kind of home service battalions, there are some real variations. I mean, so if you're in, Eng- if you happen to be in England and Wales, it's quite easy because actually the document looks almost identical to the one that was used overseas. So it's it's exactly the same thing. In Scotland, I haven't a huge amount of experience of actually looking at Scots- Scottish census documents, but there are. It's kind of visually quite similar to the England and Wales census, but it does ask different questions. Um, and also that's they aren't available on the genealogy side. So there's a, I think I think it's something like Scotland's past or something like that where they're they're all located. Irish census records are free to access, which is really good. It's a it's a tricky um it's a tricky website to navigate, if I'm being totally honest, but you can but it is all free, which is fantastic and you know it should be it should be really applauded, I think. But one of the things which is really different with Irish census records is that firstly, there is a specific set of records. So I've forgotten what the exact number is, but essentially it covers both re- sort of armies in ba- sort of regiments in barracks, but also police barracks as well. So if you're researching um oh, wow. police forces, they'll be located in that as well. And what's really noticeable is firstly, soldiers of the rank and file will almost always only be known by their initials very rarely that you actually see a soldier's name out in full it's different for officers but for for um for the rank and file it will usually always be an initial and it also includes different information as well so one of the things it includes is things like religious information which you don't get in the english and welsh census mm. um 
And so I, did, I have done the deep dive into one of the Irish regiments, um, the Prince of Wales um, and Leinster regiments. And it was really interesting, actually, just kind of seeing like the kind of the, the, the sort of the religious age makeup of that battalion. It was really, some really interesting stuff that came out of that. Um, so, yeah, that's how you can access the documents. I mean, you, there is a cost associated with it. Uh, the one thing I would just highlight, um, and I'm not an expert to this, but obviously with the most recent census, obviously got a whole new range of data. But there are significant costs associated with that. I think I calculated if I wanted to effectively repeat my research for the uh, 1922 census, it probably cost me about seven thousand pounds to do. Um, if I was if wow. I was to do for paying wow. for each individual image, yeah. so that's something definitely to bear in mind. But eventually, that you know, eventually that will change. And I think of course, I think that that will be a fantastic piece of research for some of the students probably <laughs> to be quite honest um oh, no, I've got, okay oh we're back um in terms of the answer in terms of the question about where you can find out more about the regimental system the one thing i would say which is unfortunate is that a lot of it is within the academic literature and there is a cost associated mm -hmm. with that so the, the, i'm yep. sorry the, as, as i prepared earlier um Military Identities by David French. Sorry, it helps if I do that, doesn't it? Is um, I, I think it's it, it's published in two thousand four. I still think it's the it's the standard. Essentially, it's a fantastic yeah. book. But if you go onto Amazon now, it's probably going to set you back, back back the best part of forty quid. I think it's worth it personally, but that's quite expensive. That's quite expensive for a lot of people. Um, if you're looking a little bit further beyond the regimental system, but looking at the Cardwell reforms more generally. Um, Edward Spears, the late Victorian army, is really, really good. Again, that can be a, a, a tricky one to price, but there is a good second-hand market out there, so it's worth looking at. Moving away from the academic market, um, Corelli Barnett's um, great history written in her army. That's a brilliant, that's a really good book and covers this period particularly well. Okay. I mean, Richard Richard Holmes obviously has a, has a whole host of books about the British army. Ironically, the kind of period he really doesn't cover in any great detail is this one. Um, he's got this kind of this gap from kind of in his book Red Coat, which kind of really kind of takes you up to the Crimea and era, and then um, his fantastic book Tommy, which is still a kind of a brilliant book of the British Army in the First World War. That very much deals with the army from 1914 onwards. So there is this kind of gap which he doesn't which he doesn't cover, but it is excellent. Um, kind of talking a bit more broadly, further afield. Um, this is a book I really like, which is Simon Robbins' British Generalship on the Western Front. Obviously, it's very focused on the First World War, but it does talk extensively about the Edwardian Officer Corps and have some really, really interesting and fascinating insights and really takes you away from the kind of lines led by Donkey's mythology and kind of really digs into the demographics of that Officer Corps, which I definitely think is a recommend, which is really good. Another favourite of mine from Boer War to World War by uh, Spencer Jones. Um, again, mainly focusing on kind of the tactical innovations in the post boer War era, but from a personal perspective, I think it's it's just one of the great histories of the mm -hmm. British Army, and I think it's and also really and also really affordable, which is nice for a, a history book. Um, <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the, just very quickly, finally, if you if you're kind of not in so much interested in the structural side of things, but you're more interested about the kind of the nature of the army in that side and the nature of regiments in this time there are a couple, there are various different sorts of um campaign histories which are really worth looking at again i think the exemplar even though it's nearly 40 you know, nearly 50 years old now is um john baines's morale unfortunately getting cheap copies of this are like hen's teeth i'm afraid to say but if you can ever find a cheap copy of it i i recommend you grab it with both hands as quickly as possible because it's it's a really fascinating insight into what he essentially does is look into what into a particular battalion of the um Cameronia Scottish Rifles and, and, and it's just brilliant it's a fact it's an absolutely fabulous book and then if you're kind of more geared towards um sort of personal histories and personal experiences particularly of the rank of file then there are two really good ones I mean the obvious one is um Frank Richards' Old Soldier Saab, which is like his uh, the prequel to his more famous book um, of the of the First World War, and that it's it doesn't really hold back any punches. That's the first thing I will say. You do get a very clear image of how the British Army saw itself, but also how it saw Indians in this period as well. So it can be quite an uncomfortable read, but I think he is a he's a very good writer, and I think he's a very very transparent as well. I don't think there's any kind of real artifice. He's kind of very much speaking from the experience of what it was like to be a soldier in this era. And, and uh, he's absolutely fat. And it is a really good book and I'd recommend. And then another one, which is really nice and a little bit different, is um, The Corporal and the Celestials. So this is a, this is slightly different, actually. It's effectively a it's half art book 
half sort of half um, memoir. And essentially, it's a very, from a soldier who served with the first battalion of the Royal in the Skilling Fusiliers um, in China during this same period. And his insights are really fascinating. I think he was a really un, um, the guy, James Hutchinson's the guy's name, a really unusual character, kind of a very astute observer of the world, um, and I very much admired the Chinese as well. I mean, he falls into some of the same kind of language that you would expect of a book of this era. But he actually kind of has a very kind of sympathetic eye to what's going on around him. And he kind of very much recognises, yeah, that there's this kind of what, that, you know, there is this wider world beyond the British Army and there's some really fascinating aspects to it. And it's, that's a really lovely book. And if you can, again, if you can ever get a copy of that, I don't think they're particularly expensive, they're just not particularly common. But if you can get that, it's a, it's a lovely thing to have. It's a really, yeah, really fascinating uh, I think that's kind of as well as those kind of personal stories as well. I, I open your eye up as well to a lot of their experiences, and also they're not just numbers on a page. They're actually they've got a voice, and I think that is is also important as well. That those kind of yeah. personal stories because it, it, it makes it even more not the word real, but you know, you, there's this connection you can make. I was talking to someone when I speakers a couple of months ago about connection with the sources you read, and especially when you read the personal stories, you do have that. You get you get that you kind of choke up, don't you, when you read certain things, or you can you can identify with certain things, or you know that's why it's, that's why that's why it's, that's so powerful. Um, oh, totally, and it's quite unusual to hear voices from the ranks yeah, before exactly, the first yeah. world war. I mean, there there are out there. I'm not saying addressing there aren't any at all, but it's quite rare to hear from them, and it does give you a different insight because there are millions of officers' biographies and memoirs and stuff like that. That's not uncommon to come across, but from yeah. the kind of voices from the ranks are really quite unusual, and they do. I would kind of I would suggest that they're neither of them are particularly typical. I would suggest I think they're both quite unique individuals in their own way. But I think it does yeah. give you that different insight, and yeah, absolutely, it's um, it gives Wait. you it gives it just gives you a total a different view to it, doesn't it? Exactly. I mean, because the stuff because you know I'll be looking at Victorian newspapers in in Colchester and the army's mentioned a lot and generally yeah, yeah. they're quite negative reports about the army because you obviously you know they're not liking the army's neck nearby and the interaction between the army and locals is is a contentious issue for a while so you only you know, get a one side of it you know are there this and that when you can get some personal stories you can actually see through and actually kind of see a bit more what's going on um yes not again it said not necessarily everyone's experiences but you can just get a, at least a, a tiny glimpse of it which i think is is helpful um, yeah, absolutely. We've got a nice we've got a question, actually, question to end on, actually, which is quite a nice question to end on from 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 Tim. And uh, uh, Tim, um, he just asks a question, which I think is a nice one to end on. Uh, is there a particular regiment you have fondness for, or a particular favourite story about? Maybe not a story because, uh, but maybe yeah. is that, is, that, is, is that, because, <laughs> but is there a regiment that you really do have fondness for or a connection with? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit like choosing your favourite child at the end of this project. And I think one of the things which is really, because I, I, I like to, I, before we even embarking on this project, I like to think I had quite a good idea of like the broad regimental history of the British Army. And one of the things that really came out of it was just like, oh, wow, you know, what all these amazing stories um, and like which come from individual regiments and particularly in the kind of the pre-amalgamation area, like there are whole like regiments that are kind of, kind of disappeared from the background really but kind of have these really unique and interesting particularly in the polygonic era where like so much of the history is focused on what's happening in spain and then what later happens at waterloo but then you've got kind of colonial campaigns which are taking place in sri lanka or are taking place in india or taking all of these different parts around the globe where these kind of really quite unheralded regiments are doing really pretty spectacular things so yeah i mean so picking a particular regiment is really difficult i mean i've Growing up in Staffordshire, I've always had a fondness for the kind of the two Staffordshire regiments. Um, living in sort of living in the part of Birmingham, which I do now, I think the Warwick, uh, sorry, the Warwickshire, but particularly the Worcestershire regiments as well. I think they both have really interesting histories, particularly in terms of the First World War. Um, even sort of regiments from a bit further afield, like the York, and, like the York and Lanx, um, are again one of these regiments where basically their their two main battalions really kind of don't have a huge amount of involvement in the great wars of the kind of the 18th and 19th centuries and their kind of history really you know they have this really alternative history which is, is really fascinating i think in terms of like a favorite story most of the, most of my favorite stories it has to be said are, are generally about sort of where where, where regimenting goes wrong is probably how I describe it. But uh, I mean, so I'll, I'll go. I, was, I really wanted to include this in the talk, actually. So I'm really pleased that um, that this nope, question is asked. Uh, yeah, there's, so I've mentioned them before already. The kind of Cameronian Scottish rifles, and the reason why I'm calling them the Cameronian Scottish rifles is because of the nature of their amalgamation. So 
the Cameroonians have a really long and extensive history, um, various kind of from a kind of and very strong religious history as well. They were kind of recruited out of a kind of a religious movement, effectively. Um, and the reason they're called the Cameroonians is because they're, um, I think it's James Cameron, if I've got the right person, who was who was who was a, a sort of Scottish nobleman who had raised the regiment, and it had this very kind of strong Presbyterian history. And in nineteen, uh, sorry, in, um, in eighteen eighty one, they were amalgamated with a reg the with um, the Perthshire Lights infantry who don't have a particularly spectacular history in the kind for most of their existence but in the kind of late victorian era they have produced a number of very famous officers and had seen lots of action in in various colonial conflicts and so they were very much an in vogue regiment and so you have these two cultures which are colliding and they can't stand each other and they really because effective because then also the titles change so they become the scottish rifles and for a light infantry regiment that's not too much of a step actually so they so i think they they really embrace the scottish the rifles heritage if you like and kind of are really happy to take that forward cameroonians aren't interested in that they are a line infantry regiment that's been around since the 17th century they you know they're the old 26 regiments of foot they have no interest in this kind of newfangled rifleman Mm, I mean, yeah. this is a regiment that issues a Bible to its recruits when they join the regiment, which which I think is unique as far as I'm aware. So this is, you know, they're very different cultures. And, then, and so for years, they actually refused to kind of use their full title. So the second battalion only refers to itself as the Scottish Rifles. The first battalion only refers to itself as the Cameronians. Um, and this is something that continues for much of their history. They never, neither battalion ever really gets on with each other until well after the kind of the world wars um, and it was and then what's really interesting then is when they when they eventually come around to um when you get to the kind of the 1950s armies reforms and they're trying basically this is when the first big regiments are forming and like a lot of these county regiments are disappearing from the order of battle mm. they actually decide actually do you know what? we don't want to amalgamate we're just going to disband and they disappear completely and that's the end of that that's the end of their story essentially um, wow so they are so you, there are these fans yeah there are i mean there are lots of kind there's obviously these fantastic stories of battle and bravery and ingenuity which i mean which makes it a fascinating period to study but there are these regiments of kind of very interesting social constructs i often think and all of the kind of sort of the yeah all the things that come out of that are really fascinating and like sometimes they're very funny stories like that or like you know commissioning a statue to yourself because you're being you know disbanded and you want to mourn the regiment you know stuff like that it, i mean and we laugh they had a very serious edge to it as well you know yeah. these are soldiers no, who really imagine, yeah. aren't seeing, like the history of their regiment disappearing and like and it's particularly for like the height like something like the sterling shears being kind of being um amalgamating the gordon highlanders i think they had a very good idea of what was going to happen next and that they were they were a lot of their history kind of disappeared off the radar and it very much the new regiment very much took on the characteristics of the Gordon Highlanders and the kind of the Stirlingshire regiment kind of disappeared a little bit. You can see this with the Black Watch as well, like sort of the Black Watch completely absorb the kind of the identity of um, of the regiment they're paired with. And if you go to their museum today, there's like if you look at the difference between what's in their regimental, um, you know, what's on display, a good 95% of it is either about the 42nd Regiment or the Black Watch. It's not about the regiment they amalgamated with. That their kind mm. of history very much kind of almost overlooks. It is my personal opinion, I hasten to add. I'm sure yeah. the Blackrock yeah. regiment would disagree strongly with that. But uh, yeah, that's well. Just I think idea. it's it, you find that in a lot of history. I think you find where you get certain histories which are which are promoted and others which are forgotten about. Those which are pushed push to the front and those stories which are pushed to the back. And uh, if there's a, I guess a dominant dominant uh, regiment there, they're going to push their push their their histories forward aren't they and that, so yeah. that doesn't surprise me whatsoever it doesn't surprise me i can i can see that happening uh, which, which is think, sad, and, yeah yeah and the victorians really kind of bought into the kind of the the highland mystique if you like in particular green victoria did and so that's why the highland regiments kind of really take off in terms of social exclusivity over this period so their officers are increasingly kind of from a a much narrower proportion of society mm -hmm. than they have been up to that point it's, so it does it yeah it's it, yeah it is really fascinating well, brilliant. Well, thank you, uh, Mark, for for, no, for your talk. Uh, thank you for answering the questions as well. It was absolutely fantastic. You know, people have been yeah. just saying uh, you know, they, they really enjoyed it. Fascinating uh, talk. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, I'm, yeah, so I, I'm so sorry for that. As someone who pointed the enforced interval, I do, I do apologize <laughs> for that. Um, particularly because uh, I just carried on for about a good five minutes before I'd noticed. So um, I do apologize for that. But, um, you know, thank you for bearing with me, everyone.
No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they said they, they enjoyed the interview, which, which means, which I, I, didn't, I didn't do it to do a too bad job. Um, but no, I mean, you know, thank you everyone for for coming uh, this evening. Thank you for 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 taking part, being here, listening to us talk, and we hope that we really hope that you enjoyed it. Um, so you know, if you have, please like like the videos. You know, please subscribe to History Indoors, but you know, do check out what 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 Mark's doing. You know, he, he put his email on the um on on his his slide, so you know you can watch back. You can watch it back. So if, you, if, you, if, you, if you can find his email, just check the slides later, or email us at History Indoors. We can pass your your email on to him as well. You know, please do uh, get involved. We would love to love to hear from you uh from from things uh, i've seen that comment there like a dvd's extra material <laughs> yeah. by the director's cut interview kind of thing yeah. this is perfect i love it i, I feel special yeah. um but no thank you, <laughs> yeah, thank <laughs> thank you, you so mark anyway um for for your talk because it has it's been absolutely fascinating i've loved every minute of it because as a local story i've just been just been like just taking it all in there's so many things i need to think about now um I'm after email you at some point as well with with with, with some ideas that I need some formatting yeah, with. But um, <laughs> that's fantastic. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone. I really appreciate. It. Thank you everyone. Cheers. Have a good night. Yeah, have a good night, and we'll we 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 will see you all. Well, hopefully, see you all, audience, in two weeks' time for for our next talk. But until then, thank you very much for watching, and we will see you very soon. So good night, everyone.